welcome to a new episode of Live the African Dream podcast. I am your host, Eunice Ajim, and today I am super excited. We have yet another founder series. Today we have Richmond Bassi. He's the founder of Bamboo, an investment platform that gives Africans the tools to build wealth from the ground up through real-time access to the global markets. Bamboo was one of the very first companies in Nigeria to offer access to global markets, and today, Bamboo has scaled beyond Nigeria and now getting into Ghana. Prior to running Bamboo, Richmond was the chief of staff at Helium Health, a tech startup in Africa. Richmond, it is so great to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Ines. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. No, definitely. Every single time, I make sure that my introductions are very short because I love to just ask the founder, tell me about your journey, right? I've been a founder (laughs) myself. It's easy to praise and say how amazing you're doing with your company, but I know there's so much more behind the story and I would love to hear that from the day you were born. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so you can go ahead and just give us a quick overview of your journey and what led you to starting Bamboo. To being a founder, oh, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Richmond, Richmond Bassi. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bamboo. Uh, Bamboo is an online investment platform that allows Africans to invest and grow their wealth. Um, you can buy US stocks, ETFs, and fixed returns on Bamboo. Um, Bamboo is currently operational in Nigeria and Ghana. Um, we're working about, we're all working on launching in South Africa um, pretty soon. Um, and essentially our goal and our mission is to ensure that uh, Africans have a platform, have a one-stop shop for investing their money and doing so in a way that is frictionless, it's easy um, and it makes sense. Um, and and I'm, I'm joining Eunice today on the podcast. I'm excited to be here to talk about my journey um, being a founder. I think um, I think I, I went to university because I, I always wanted to make and build things. So I, I was told that engineering was what you have to do if, <laughs> if you wanted to be a builder uh, of things. Um, so I went to school. I studied engineering. Um, and toward my final year, my... my Third, fourth year in university, I realized that oh, I wanted to build things with technology. I wanted, I wanted to be in tech. Um, so I got a job as a student at a tech company um, in London at the time. At the time, I was a data analyst. Um, so started as a data analyst. Um, and then I then became a product manager, um, building products, actually building programs, which was exciting because that's what I was always wanted to do. I wanted to you know, figure out how things work and and bring them to life. Um, and then I moved back to Lagos uh, after I graduated from university. I think I worked one more year and then I moved back to Lagos to do my NYC. Um, in Nigeria, NYC is something that as a graduate, you are required to do to serve the country um, for a year. So I moved back to do that. Um, I mean, my parents required that I <laughs> that I moved back to <laughs> To Lagos to do that, um, so, so I moved so back let me, and let me let me understand. So you're born and raised in Nigeria, right? And then you Correct. went to school in in the UK, right? Before Correct. returning, okay, got it. Yes, that's correct. Um, and so I moved back and then I joined a firm, a VC firm at the time, um, called Level Five Lab, L Five Lab, and mm-hmm. Level Five Lab was many things. It was uh, an incubator, an incubator where a lot of companies come to be incubated, um, and it was also an accelerator where uh, there were companies that you know were trying to scale up their revenue, um, and we also invested in companies that we took um, majority stake in and had to bring operational expertise um, to ha- help grow, uh, and so I was involved in in doing a lot of. I wasn't. Involved in the deal side of the of the of the of L5 Lab where I was making the deals, but I was 
on the operational side where I was working, you know, on those deals, working with founders, um, working on, on, on portfolio companies, working on new ideas that we we're trying to incubate. Um, so there, were a lot of, there was a lot of expertise that I was exposed to on, on building a company, what it meant to build a company, to take it from scratch, you know, what a company looks like when it's not just getting started and it's gone, it has, you know, made some traction and there are decisions you have to make for growth and things like that. So it was a good exposure um, and I did that for a couple of years. So I was very, very blessed to have done that, especially in Nigeria, especially um, in Africa, because I was passionate about Nigeria, I was passionate about Africa, and eventually I wanted to do something in the space, right? So that was a good precursor to that. Um, but having done that for a few years, I felt like I had gained all the knowledge I needed. I'd, got, I'd gotten exposed to different types of business models, B2B businesses, B2C businesses, um, even tech projects for, for the government, for example, how those run, and all these things. I'd seen all of it. Um, yeah. And I decided I wanted to be an operator. I wanted to go on the other side of actually making daily decisions for a business. So I joined a company at the time called Helium Health. Uh, that was building electronic medical records for African hospitals, African healthcare sector. Um, and also that was another phenomenal hands-on experience. I was like, okay, great. You're not just a consultant or a product advisor from, from the investor side. You're now making you know, the daily decisions. You're now involved in looking at the risk, looking at the reward, looking at making decisions around product, decisions around expansion, trying to you know do things and and literally build a company from scratch. Um, and that was very exciting um, until the insights, the conviction for Bamboo came somewhere along that journey where it was just impossible for me and my friends to invest in US stocks. And it was just yeah. a pain. It was just something that we couldn't do and we knew our friends that were not in Nigeria, that were in San Francisco, in LA, in different parts of the world, that could pull out a phone and, and you know, they could show you their portfolio in, in the US stock market, for example. And, and I couldn't. I didn't have that. And that was the kick. Yeah. That was like, wow, this is impossible, really? And then re and asking that question over, it's not possible, really? Like, going down that rabbit hole of asking why it's not possible and then researching and, and having meetings and having discussions with people um, is worth on earth the idea and the, the conviction that, hey, we can build a business out of this. We can actually solve this problem, not just for ourselves, but for the entire you know, African market, for Nigerians and across the continent. Um, and maybe we could. Um, so that was how we got started. And at some point I had to quit my job you know, and focus on Bamboo full time. At some point I had to convince my co-founder to quit her job. So we both quit our jobs. Um, and then had to raise money and then had just went through the whole process of starting the company until we got here, talking to Eunice on this podcast. <laughs> it's so funny how you were just like, yeah, like, you know, like we had a conviction and then we quit our job and then like raise money and now we're here. I'm like, yes, Rachel, like that sounds super fun and super easy. Like anybody could do that. Like it's easy, right? Like, Everybody out there, go out and quit your job and start a company. I, I, re I really believe anybody can um, can can build a business. I mean, that's very true. It just takes a different kind of resilience. It takes a different kind of craziness. I mean, for you to even think that I can't I can't trade on the stock market is super easy if I'm in the US. Why is it that it's so hard for me to do it? Why sitting somewhere? you know, in Nigeria or in Lagos, I want to do it. And then saying, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to figure out how to make it easy for the average African to trade on the stock market. I mean, like, Rishmo, let's take a step back, like, and let's listen to that again. It takes a different kind of craziness to be able to take on, on that ambition. So you guys decide we're going to build this. You know, what is the thought process I mean, I know you have an engineering background. Like, do you decide yeah. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to build this product myself? Or yeah. let me go out and find engineers. Let me go out and find customers. And you guys yeah. are doing great. You went from pre-seed to seed. You're thinking about, you know, putting out there Series A. I mean, you're growing and you've had challenges. And we're going to go over all of that. But, like, just talk me through the whole journey of launching Bamboo and, like, getting to where you guys are today. 
Well, I think um, when you have a complex problem or when you have any problem at all, it's breaking down the problem into its components, into its different parts, and then figuring out those parts individually. So one of the biggest things that we wanted to first answer when we're getting started at Bamboo is, is this possible legally? Is there a legal reason why Nigerians are not buying U.S. stocks today or are not investing globally today? We wanted to make sure that legally there was no reason why. And, and when we researched the law, so we had to hire a bunch of lawyers, um, both in Nigeria and both in the U.S., to research the, you know, the legal framework in the country. Is there any law that, that restricts Nigerians from owning securities in a foreign market or in a foreign yeah. um, country or in another country outside Nigeria? And, and, the, and, the, and the, the law came back to, to literally say that there is no such law that stops Nigerians, that restricts. In fact, the law allows you to be able to own assets as you want to. Um, so that's, again, one checkbox ticked. So you move to the next thing. So what, why, what is the restriction then? Why hasn't anybody done this? And then you go to look at, okay, what's the technology like? What does it, what does it take to do um, a, to, to build a platform that allows this? Do we have, are we able to KYC Nigerians? Thankfully, at the time when we got started, there were KYC businesses that had started like Smile Identity, um, like Approve, um, a bunch of them are getting started, so we could review their tech stack and say, okay, yes, there's, there are ways for us to be able to collect people's identities digitally, verify those identities, and 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 know who is on the other side of the app trying to get on. And then the second, and then, then we we take that box, right? And then you move to the next one, payments. How do we how do we collect payments? And then, thankfully for us at Bamboo, you know, someone was solving payments. There was there was Flutterwave, there was Space Stack. Um, and we could review their own tech stack and their technology and say, okay, great, this is how we're going to move monies from point A to point B to get it into the brokerage accounts for our users. Um, and that not ticked off. And then the next thing is, okay, how do we do the trades? Like, what, what does that engine look like? What does that engine look like? Um, and, and then we found a partner. And then we just kept going like that. So little wins. It's little wins like that that build conviction. So when I say, you know, we built the conviction to go ahead, it was, it, it's exactly that. It's that from one step um, to the other, from one process to the other, from one component of your business to the other, you can see why it could work. And your conviction is built because you're getting yeses or you're getting small wins. Not that you're not getting no's or you're not having challenges, but you're double clicking into those challenges and really figuring out the why why does this exist um and i think that's how we that's how we got started from solving little problems like that to you know now putting the team together um to start writing the code um, putting the marketing team together to putting every team that came together um to, 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 to for bamboo to be what it is today um yeah so that's literally how we got started no and i love that right and i think um in the process of you explaining um, I didn't hear fundraising, right? I heard, hey, we first made sure that it was actually a problem. When we had a conviction that this was a problem, we made sure, okay, why has nobody done this before? And then we decided, okay, like, what's the legal? Like, what does the product look like? What does marketing look like, right? And you actually went out there and built something and tested the market, tested the water um before ever going to out to fundraise and the only reason i'm bringing this up is because one of the biggest 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 questions or things that i hear especially from african founders is i'm having a really hard time fundraising um you know most africans can fundraise and i'm like well africans have you know like people are writing checks you know maybe reassess your business again maybe go out there and improve your product or improve you know like find the right customers build traction because at the end of the day if people can see that you're building something meaningful and it's not just because you're selling them it's because they're actually yeah. seeing the results they can see the growth um yeah. the fundraising is going to come um for yeah. any of the listening the listeners out there um what like, how did you go about fundraising? And I'm not saying give us all your little secrets, yeah. right? But, like, what was your approach and what would you tell any founder out there that is maybe even struggling to raise their pre-seed round? Yeah, no, I absolutely. I think, I think that to your point around fundraising and, and the order of when it comes, there, 
there's different types of fundraising, even with there are different types of um, stages a company is at for which it requires um, certain um, types of funding. Um, for us, you know, while we were still trying to figure out the business, it was we needed money to to put some parts of the business together. So at that stage, where it is, it is you neither have a product nor you have a business. To, to be honest, um, there's a type of funding, there's a type of financing that can come in there. You can find angel investors um, to that you can share the vision with and explain it. And if they trust you enough, if you you know if they are able to trust you enough as the person, you can you can raise money from angel investors. But there's also a a, um, a cap to how much you can really raise from angel investments. Um, so that's why it typically comes in earlier because the bigger venture capitalists or venture capital firms may not may think you're too early or this is there's no viable business here, so it's not worth their while or worth their time. But an angel investor might see the opportunity and partner up with you as a finance partner um, and while you're the operating partner, you're figuring it out and they trust you enough. Um, so having um, some sort of track record um, is important at that stage. So difficulty would come where no one knows you from anywhere, there's no track record. And sometimes you know you're, it's, it's hard to get over that loop of trust. Um, and, and that's and that's where the challenges can come in. Um, I do remember someone that was an angel investor at Bamboo when we just got started. Um, I think I pitched him the opportunity at Bamboo and the business, and he said he said to me that I don't really understand what you just said. I don't get the full picture, but I'm giving you this this amount because it's you, Richmond, and because I know you, right? So I was able to get away with that because of that type of relationship that we have. So sometimes it helps. And um, to have some sort of track records and you're going to angel investors that you know around you, that you already have relationships with, maybe from your professional life or professional experience. Um, and then moving away from that, you start, you know, you've gone taking some of these angel investments that you've gotten started with. Maybe at a time where you, you raise some pre-seed round. And, and by the way, for those listening, I don't know what a pre-seed round is. It's literally, like we said earlier, the stage of your business where you need to have you know, a product built or any users or any, any revenue generated, um, but you have an idea and you're trying to piece it together and you perhaps need some funding for, um, for doing that and for arriving somewhere productive. And you approach someone with some money and they, you know, give you money to, 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 to go ahead, ahead to launch the business. Um, but let's assume that we have done that and we've gotten some traction. Now we've been able to hire one or two engineers um, and we've been to write, you know, build the business. Or maybe we've built it ourselves and somehow we need some marketing people to join us. Or we need, you know, to spend some money on Google um, d display ads to, to, put to, you know, you need to do something, you know, to get the business out there. And, and now you have some users, you have some traction. You've, there's a, now there's a product you can use and you have some people using it. Um, and it's trending upwards. You know, a lot of people are, are getting into the app and it's becoming a thing. And, you know, you, one user is telling another user and another user. Um, and you can see that you've, you've gone from zero to one, literally, from the theory of the idea or the hypothesis of the business to some version of it that has users on it and it's gaining some traction. Um, or you might even be earlier earlier than that, where you've just been able to use your pre-seed to, to just build the app and you have a few users. Now you need some money to go and really double down on the opportunity and explore the market and find the market and find uh, whether you can get product market fit for your business, right? And then you raise some seed capital. And for Bamboo, we did the same thing. Um, thankfully for us, we were able to get into a program, the Y Combinator, program um before we raise our seed capital and that was and exciting yeah, like, thankfully we were able to get into the y combinator <laughs> <laughs> i'm yeah, thankful for be... that because i think yeah. that dramatically um helped our journey mm -hmm. no for sure and a lot of founders getting into either you know one of those either us um 
programs Y Combinator, Dexters, 500 Global. Yeah. Like if if you can really apply to one of those and get in one of them, it dramatically accelerates. Um, no, absolutely. And, and and I would say that it, and, and I would say that founders should should consider, especially if you're in the early stages, because there's a lot you learn from. You know, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and as a founder, what you really are, a problem solver, right? You've seen a problem, you're trying to solve it, and that's all. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have all the skills that you require. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have all the knowledge that you require or the access that you require to be able to solve your problem, uh, the problem that you're, you want to solve. And many times, um, an accelerator like the Y Combinator helps you with different types of toolkits, different types of, um, and not just toolkits for you know building a business, but also a network, a very strong supportive network that you can leverage you know for your journey as a founder. Um, so we got into one. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, Sorry. that network was powerful because I know you mentioned earlier how you were like, yeah, like, you need to have some level of traction or, like, people, like, the right people need to know you. It's not about who you know, but it's about, you know, what they know about you. That's one of the things that I like to mention because let's just be honest, right? Like, not a lot. Like, it takes, like, you didn't just wake up one day, right? Nobody knew you, and you were like, I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to launch Bamboo, and I'm going to be successful at fundraising, right? You went to school. You worked at a couple of startups, right? You worked in a VC fund. Um, and then, right, you were like, let me go and put this. So you had already built some level of network, and it's one of the, the most powerful things that, like, if anybody can get anything out of this conversation, it's like, focus on building relationship with the right people because you never know when you're going to need them. Um, but if you wait too late and you're like, hey, I'm building a company, I'm having a hard time, like on my LinkedIn, on my Twitter, like every single day I get emails about people saying, I'm struggling to fundraise. I'm sorry. Like if you're struggling to fundraise, it's probably because you don't just know the right people. So focus on building that network. Um, and there are so many ways to do that, you know, with social media and access to internet. Um, that if you're not, right, like you will probably struggle, you know, doing anything. And, and that happens even when you're trying to grow your company without thinking of fundraising, like even just attracting the right customers, getting into the, the right networks um, to be able to take your company from point A to Z. Um, it takes a level of uh, relationship to be able to do that. Yeah, no, leveraging relationships is very important. I think also... Leveraging relationships is a thing that grows. You wouldn't have everyone in your network that you need at every given point in time, but you can um, you can get introduced to people. So one of the things that we ha we were we were taught in Y Combinator to do um, when fundraising is asking those that have committed to your around to introduce you to other people um, that could possibly be investors. Um, so as you fundraise, as you go through the process, you you would find that your network will begin to grow. No founder would start off with a great investor network, um, but the work of a CEO or the work of a founder is to build that network, to be able to get yourself in front of the people that you require to fund your business or to work with you as partners. Okay. No, awesome, awesome. So I do want, I know we don't have much time, but I do want to get a little bit deeper into Bamboo. And I know we spoke a lot about fundraising. And thank you so much for yeah. sharing your wisdom um, with some of the listeners today. Is it fair to say that Bamboo is Robin Hood for Africa? Because that's the way I have it in my mind. <laughs> well, you can say that. Or you have, um, a, different, we... or you have a different one. <laughs> Yes, we do. We, we, we would say sometimes, and we've said sometimes that we are the fidelity for Africa and because we believe that the business that we're building is much more broader than okay. what Robin Hood does, okay. um, and which is just a retail business. We do have a B2B business um, as well. Um, we have an API business as well. So our goal is to completely own the suite of investing tools to enable both African retail and African institutional investors to invest, you know, in an easy and simple manner. Um, so, yes, we call ourselves a fidelity for Africa. Okay, good. Okay, well, that's a great correction. Um, and obviously, fidelity <laughs> does a lot more than 
Robin Hood because I just feel like Robin Hood appeals mostly to retail investor um, and it seems like you're trying to bridge not just retail investor but also institutional investors yes absolutely okay. great and in terms of growth you know like what are we thinking like where at what stage are you at right now and where do you see bamboo in the next five to ten years for example Wow, five to ten years is a long time, um, but <laughs> <laughs> but we are we are literally heads down working on on expansion right now um, because that's where we are at, at the stage of our business. We're looking at expanding our footprint in in Nigeria, which is our home market, and there's a lot that we're doing in that regard. Um, we're expanding to multiple countries at the same time. So we just launched Ghana about two months ago. And we're doing South Africa next. And yeah, we have a list of other African countries that we are expanding our, our, our service to. Um, and our goal literally is just to ensure that if you're an African from any con country in the continent, or even you're, if you're an African that lives abroad and you want to invest, um, you would have the tools, the access, and the platform to do so. Okay. And that makes sense. I think one thing that, um, one, one question that uh, I've, I've been thinking about, but um, I think like almost every, and I, and I mentioned this earlier, I'm like, we, are, we, we love to share the success stories and how we're doing great. But almost every startup that I know or startup founder that I know has had a company near that experience. Um, <laughs> so... I would love to know if uh, Bamboo has experienced one of those in the past and how you have been able to navigate them. No, absolutely. Um, we ran out of money before we raised our seed round. And, <laughs> and I, I remember that I, I needed to borrow some money to pay, uh, to pay our salaries. Um, wow. And... And... We didn't have money for a few months, so I was I was borrowing money um, until we really needed a lot of money. So I went to an uncle of mine that I know, and and he he loaned us some money, and and I was able to convince him that I was going to pay him back the money because we just got into Y Combinator, so we're going to go into Y Combinator and we're going to get some cash, um, and then I'm going to go on to raise our seed round and it will go all well, and some. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I convinced him, um, and and that was that was very. And the money came timely because we we didn't have to pay our, our staff, um, and we didn't just have money to continue to operate the business. Um, so that was a near death experience. And thank God that uh, we had people around us that we could we could leverage to to, to hoop that, over that. Wow. No, I mean that's that's a good story, and. Um, the perfect story for the current time that we're in, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> with the market downturn and, you know, just VC, um, not, you know, like just slowing down on deploying capital, um, it is a very real story. Like every single portfolio company. I was very optimistic earlier this year when everybody was like, hey, like we're about to get into a recession and all of these crazy things. I was like, nah, you guys shut up. Stop scaring founders, like let them go. Um, and then like slowly as we've been getting into quarter, I'm telling my founders like, hey, like if you can get at least 24 months of runaway, please do, right? Like anything you can, because the last thing you want to do is run out of cash. Um, that's one of mm. the biggest killer of any, like, like the first one is running out of money. The second one is like co-founder disagreement. Um, yeah. So it's such such a good example um, that you've just you've just mentioned. You know, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, Richmond, man, I wish we had more time because I have so many other questions that I didn't even get <laughs> um, to ask. But we try to keep this podcast usually roughly under thirty minutes. We go a little bit above, but we try not to do that. Well, thank you so much, Richmond. It was such a pleasure having you on the podcast today. Um, for all the listeners listening, um, this was Leave the African Dream. Um, you can find Richmond on most social media, I would assume LinkedIn at least, and Twitter. And if you have not signed up yet on Bamboo, this is your sign.
And until next time, you all have a good rest of your day.